All right, so welcome to Designing for Development, the value of collaborative design, and I am going to just jump right in and get started. My name is Michelle. Hi. Um, I am from Minneapolis, so thank you for being warmer than 20 degrees. That's pretty great. Um, and uh, I've been an independent designer for about five years and uh, been doing WordPress for many of those years. So uh, I'm really glad to be able to come out here and speak to you guys. I, I love being able to share this stuff with everybody. Um, the biggest thing in my journey as an independent designer, as well as formerly working at an agency, was that um, I've done a lot of work um, both with developers and with full teams and the biggest thing that I've seen is that there's been a huge struggle um, trying to transition from a traditional workflow that worked in the old media like print workflow um, to new workflow that better integrates um, rapid development, multimedia, being able to iterate on things quickly. and. Um, there's been a lot of struggle with that, trying to kind of shoehorn new methods into the old way of doing things. And what I've learned is that a collaborative workflow works the best. Um, so what is, what is collaborative design and uh, how can it help make the design and development process run smoother? Now, to talk about collaborative design, we need to talk about kind of the opposite of that first, which is the waterfall method. Um, which is a traditional method uh, and how most specialty shops or developers uh, and designers and project managers within a larger company usually work together. Um, if you're not familiar with what the waterfall method is, this is basically kind of a, a synopsis of that. So first of all, the client uh, will have an idea. Um, if it's, if it's a smaller shop, the client will often go to a design firm and then the design firm kind of works on that and then goes to a development firm to get it built. Um, within a larger company, there's still a lot of roles like this too. It usually pro passes from department to department to department. Um, supposedly in the waterfall model, there is a clear handoff of roles at each stage. So like content is done, awesome, goes to design, design is just done, and then it's awesome, and it goes to development, and they build it, and it's great, and it's super obvious. Um, Communication also often has to pass through several levels of each stage. If it's a bunch of different shops working together, now you've got the design shop who's talking to the client and the development shop is talking to the design shop and there's not a clear method of communication between the developers and the client. If it's inside at a larger organization, you know, oftentimes there's still kind of a process you have to go through to get through that. And the downside of this is that oftentimes content is not even ready at the beginning. So we're not even really starting with content. We're starting with kind of an idea, going into design, going into development. Content kind of gets shoved in there randomly. It's not good. And there's a lot of downsides to using this waterfall model in web development and web design. Um, the biggest one, first of all, is project scoping assumptions. Basically, whoever's first in that chain has to make assumptions about all of the rest of the work. So say you're this designer or this design firm or this design team talking directly to the client and development's not involved yet. You are responsible suddenly for scoping all the development work that you may not be qualified to be talking about. Like That's a difficult position for everyone to be in both the designer and the developer later who has to kind of live up to those promises. Another big downside is inefficient communication. Like I said, there's a lot of steps you have to go through in Waterfall and if someone at the end of the chain wants to talk to the client, they probably don't have a direct method of communication. They probably have to go back up through the designer or back up through whatever person came before them and it's kind of like a game of telephone, like it takes forever and things get misinterpreted and it's really inefficient. Another downside to the waterfall model is it's really hard to adapt to the changing requirements of the project. Like, if something changes during the development phase, you know, who's, who's making the design decisions about those changes? If something changes on the client side, you know, who is communicating that to the developer? How is that going to be working? It's really hard to adapt when you're using a waterfall model. And another problem, and especially this happens a lot during scope changes, is that people have to make decisions outside of their area of expertise. So whether that's, again, a designer having to quote development work or say what it's going to take to do something, whether that's a developer having to make design decisions near the end because of, the, because of things changing, we're, we're not taking advantage of people's expertise. 
And all of these things lead to basically bloated time frames and project delays because there's all these inefficiencies, there's all these problems, and this is what's happening. So the alternative to the waterfall model is a collaborative workflow. And this is basically when design and the development and the client all work together from the beginning, which is kind of overseen by your project management arm. And that looks a lot more like this, which is a big difference from the waterfall. Um, all three of them influence each other. There's not really a clear transition between them. You know, as you, you, you may start with some beginner content, and as you're working on the design, you might realize that the content that you thought you were going to be showing is not really going to work well from like a user standpoint or from it doesn't really fit with what you're actually trying to say like you have 40 paragraphs and you really need a few bullet points so that goes back to influence the content as the development is working we may realize that some of the design decisions that were made before aren't very good or it might influence how the content is working and the content might influence how the development is working so it's a lot more of a realistic workflow to do it this way and that leads to more accurate scoping because everyone's involved from the beginning. If the designer and the project manager and the developer are all in the room when we're scoping out a project, everyone's bringing in their knowledge and is able to you know, come up with a more accurate uh, quote. Um, there's also more direct communication. Now, in a smaller team, like everyone might actually be able to communicate with everyone else directly. I understand in larger teams, you know, there may still be a point of contact where it's like you do have to talk to the head of design or the head of development, but still, the heads of design, heads of development, the head of the project management for that project and whoever's representing the client are all still talking to each other. There's no chain of command, it's kind of equal, and then those people tell their team members what to do. And because of that, it's a lot easier to adapt to changing requirements because everyone is able to weigh in. We don't have to wait for an inefficient communication. We don't have to wait for um, going through the chain of command. And we don't have people trying to uh, quote things out of scope because we're leveraging everyone's strengths as needed. If we, if we could benefit from the developer you know, having input at a certain point, they're there to have input. If we could benefit from the client having input at a certain point, they're there to have input. And this efficiency basically leads to time and money saved for everyone. That's for the client, that's for you know, whether it's a design, t a design firm who's subcontracting to a developer, whether that's developers who have to subcontract out to get more help, everyone's saving money and saving time in this scenario. This is kind of a, this is a sample workflow. It's from a book called The Strategic Web Designer by Christopher Butler, which I highly recommend. It's a very interesting book, um, just about web development workflows overall. Um, and it's kind of one interpretation of how this workflow could work. And the way it works is linearly, you proceed from left to right, um, but you notice how things are stacked, so they're happening concurrently. Um, so content creation, uh, it's kind of like the top level is kind of content, the middle level is kind of development, the bottle, bottom level is design. You notice they're kind of all happening at the same time. And so how does this work in practice? So I'm gonna break it down to basically each of the roles in the process and what that looks like for you. So let's say you're a designer. What does the collaborative workflow look like for you? First of all, when possible, what we want to do is at the beginning stages, we want to work more abstractly. So we're not jumping right into mock-ups. We are doing a lot more abstract things. And this is a particular method called style tiles. This is one that I use personally, and I've had a lot of success with, with uh, clients big and small. Um, and what this is, is basically kind of like a mood board for design. So I present this to the client at the beginning. This is kind of like, this is the concept of what your site will look like. Um, but we're not talking about like how many pixels from the top the Facebook like button is going to be. We're talking about like, no, like this is my interpretation of your brand. What do you think? And we can have this conversation. This is how we're able to work on things very rapidly and be able to prototype it without worrying about like how big the margin is between like the contact form and the next paragraph. Like, high level stuff at the beginning. And this can be shared early with the developers to keep them in the loop about design decisions. Yes? What is this called? This is called style tiles. I can't see it on the Oh, yeah, I, I'll have all my slides up afterwards. So um, you'll have a link to be able to see all of it and oh, everything. Oh, yeah, so you don't have to freak out about writing everything down. I mean, no, you're fine. Ask all the questions, it's great. Um, 
as well as doing something like style tiles, we're also going to be working on wireframes. And everybody has kind of a different interpretation of whether they should be static wireframes or interactive wireframes. And it kind of depends on your design and development workflow, like whether the designers are actually doing some front end development or whether they're staying strictly in concept mode and you have front end developers, whatever. Some sort of wireframe should be created at the same time we're working on these style tiles. But the important thing, especially when working with something like WordPress, which is a content management system, is we're not worrying about making a wireframe for every single page. What we're doing is we're worrying about making a wireframe for each type of the way content is displayed. So for example, there could be a bunch of pages that are basically a standard post or page type, like a big image and some text under it. You don't need to make a wireframe for every single one of those pages. But if you've got like a unique page that's going to have some kind of interesting content layout, start doing that. And your wireframes can be as detailed or as non-detailled as, you know, as it makes sense at the, like maybe at the beginning it's more sketched out, gets more full fidelity as it goes on. Maybe some of the wireframes are more interactive if your designers are typically doing some, some of the front end development. But whatever the case is, you want to make sure that you're showing how each different type of content lays out. So say your site has like an e-commerce, you know, what does the search results page look like? What does the cart look like? How are all these things working? And I usually also like to do, actually first, I like to do kind of a mobile version of it um, so I can kind of prioritize what order the content is going to show up in and kind of get a sense of what's the most important. So I kind of do both for each of them. This, this mobile version, actually, I have it go all the way down and go through the whole entire thing, but this is kind of just to show you both of them. Have you ever used uh, different computer programs that are out there, like Concept Draw or something like that? I have not. I, like, me personally, I'm most comfortable with um, one, pen and paper, two, Illustrator. There's a lot of really good prototyping and wireframing programs out there, so I say whatever works for your workflow makes the most sense for you. Um, so after we've gotten through our style tiles and our wireframes and the client has an understanding of what, um, what the look and feel is going to be, we're also showing this to the developer so they're starting to get an idea of the content types and how it's going to be placed so they can start weighing in on it. Uh, next, what the designer would be working on is actual system assets. Um, so this is an example of system assets for just like one specific brand, um, H1 through H6, you know, paragraph tags, list, ordered lists, unordered lists, um, tabs and forms and stuff. Not actually a layout of any kind of site, but again, to get an idea of how all the most common elements are going to be styled. And you can collaborate with your developer to find out what kind of assets they're going to need. Again, if you're going to be having a site with a lot of form fields, you probably want to make sure you're paying attention to those. If you've got a site with like a cart and different kinds of buttons and interactive things that you're going to need there, the developer can tell you what you need. Because you're all collaborating at the beginning, so it's great. Um, I like, again, to work in mobile first. Uh, just because you're getting to the most basic elements, you're not kind of crowding it up with a big size, so you're really prioritizing how it's going to look on the smallest screen. Then once you get past that point, um, sometimes there are instances where it makes sense to do a somewhat full fidelity mock-up or a full fidelity mock-up. It all depends on your client, um, maybe with their real content, maybe with lorem ipsum. Something like this I did just mainly for the, the developer's ease of use because sometimes it's easier to communicate like no I really do actually want it this way and I did it in both like the widest screen possible and the smallest screen possible so that they would know how it breaks. This step's not always necessary. Sometimes if you're working back and forth or if your front end development kind of overlaps with your design and your development, um, some of the same people who are doing the wireframes are going to be building out your actual front end and so you may not have to go to this stage. A lot of clients actually do understand style tiles pretty well, like they get it, like give, give them a chance. Like there are a lot of literal minded clients I've had that still when I showed them a wireframe and a style tile like really understood what was going on and we didn't have to do a mock-up. So it does depend on your workflow, but you know, if the step is done, make sure to do it both extremes, not just a desktop only view. Um, and this is, this is kind of also a good spot, um, if you didn't do it in wireframes, to start talking about where your breakpoints are going to be for content in responsive. Um, I recommend, just as an aside, not doing device-based device breakpoints when you're doing responsive design, meaning don't think about iPhones and iPads. Um, just think about 
let the content dictate where your site breaks, even if it's at like 672 pixels, like, okay, so what? Awesome. Um, it doesn't matter because we don't know what internet enabled round dog bowls we're going to be browsing the internet on in the future. Like we don't know what devices there are going to be. So don't think about devices. It's kind of just a side point of uh, design philosophy. I also like to have some way where I spell out specific things for the developer if I'm not the one that's building it. Um, so like, what the actual colors are, spell that out. Um, what are the margins? This is a kind of nifty little tool for Adobe products called Spectre um, that auto automatically generates all this stuff so I don't have to. So if, if I'm turning over something that's actually a mock-up, I can be like, look, my logo is this. Like, the developer doesn't have to go into like my Illustrator or my Photoshop file and like measure the size of things. Like, that's a pain. That I don't need to make them do that. That's inefficient. Um, Another thing, oh, that's really great. Um, another thing that I like to do is give them actual like CSS, not maybe CSS they'll copy and paste, but of many of these reusable elements. So like I can give them a CSS file of like the H1 to H6 and what I expect it to be, what I expect lists to be. Um, this helps there not be too many assumptions. And again, it does depend on your design and development workflow, whether you expect your designers to do this stuff. I think most web designers should at least be able to do this. Like even if it's not like semantic CSS for specific things that we're copying and pasting and using on the live site, like we can at least write colors and sizes and weights and margins and that kind of stuff in CSS. So this is everything that the designer has been doing. So now what, what is the developer doing in this collaborative workflow? The biggest difference is actually that the developer should be involved really early. Um, I literally only use this image so I could have a gratuitous biking Minneapolis picture in, in my presentation. <laughs> like, yeah, we're pretty great. Um, a lot of developers are accustomed to being involved only at the end of the process, but they really should be being brought in at or near the beginning. And I know that there's kind of mixed feelings on this. Um, many developers I do know that are very proactive would be very happy to be involved near the beginning, especially if they don't have to live up to promises somebody else made. But there are still some people that are like, no, just like tell me what to do and I'll just do it. But honestly, Developers, like everyone else who's important to the project, should be involved at the beginning because they can bring up issues of functionality that may not be able to be addressed. Or, sure, we can do it, but not in the time allotted. Or, sure, not we can do it, but not in the budget allotted. Or, we can do all of the, we can do two out of these three things, which are the most important. That's that's really important for a developer to be there for, which can affect the final design and the final content, or whether we phase two something, or whether we phase one and a half something. Another thing that developers will have to be responsible for is knowing the design system that's been put in place, which is another good thing to be being brought in early. Now developers a lot of times will be like, no, I'm not a designer, like I don't design. But developers do often have to make some minor design decisions as things go on, like especially when we're doing kind of interesting like agile development, rapid prototyping, that kind of stuff. You know, there may have to be a button somewhere that nobody kind of accounted for. Or there may have to be like this slightly different page type that no one has accounted for. But if the developer understands the design system, they've got clear direction on what the color schemes are, what kind of the general margins and spacing and priority and hierarchy is, they can make some of those decisions without having to have the designer create another mock-up or go through another thing. So that's, that's really useful for a developer being involved early. And again, there's going to be a lot more um, rapid prototyping, iterating, and testing. In the specific workflow that I brought up early from the strategic web designer, uh, what they do is they have the developers, basically while the designers are creating these high-level design things that don't do anything, um, the developers are creating functional wireframes that do stuff but don't look like anything. Like stuff is basically in the right place and it works, but there's no style applied whatsoever. And that's kind of interesting too, because it gives you a chance to test how the functionality is going to work before you get a chance to marry it to the design. You don't have to just wait on the development. Um, for those of you that are maybe working on your own and want to implement part of this process, um, one of the things that I've done for my smaller clients is basically this step is, is like the the basic child theme that I start building before I start actually theming it. Like I start putting the content in, I've got a, a working structure, um, but it doesn't look like anything, but we can start testing, like here's how the form process works, or here's how the membership sign up process works, blah, blah, blah. And we can see how it's working while we're still, you know, revising what the design is going to look like. 
so that's kind of an int that's kind of how developers are involved. So then how, how are project managers involved in all of this? And I hope you guys heard Kareem talk this morning because he touched on a lot of these things in way better detail than me, but just to kind of gloss this over, um, the biggest thing project managers have to do is be the bridge between everyone's goals. Here's another gratuitous Minneapolis picture. Um, each silo on the team has their own kind of individual goals. Like, design is really concerned with making it look right or making it be really usable. I mean, development is really concerned with making it work right. Um, you know, sales is really concerned with making money. Um, but everybody's kind of got a different end goal, though we're all building the same project. Um, the good project manager understands kind of all of these goals and helps to be the bridge between them in terms of communication and how to be able to direct the project forward. And project managers also understand different communication styles. So like, how do different people ask questions? How do different people on your team like to process information? Do, do some people like to have things spelled out with them? Do some people work better with more autonomy? Do some people like to problem solve with collaboration? Do some people like to problem solve by kind of going into a cave and like typing and then coming up with something? They understand how all these different things work and are able to manage them more effectively and that's really important. So we've talked about kind of the whole team, but there is another piece to the collaborative workflow that's really important, and that is actually the client. And so how does, how does the client collaborate well in a collaborative workflow? And the biggest thing that a client can do is leaving good feedback. So if any of you in here are clients of a WordPress company, or if you have clients that, th these are some ways that you as a client or your clients can be taught to give better feedback that's more productive. So if you're providing feedback to a design, the biggest thing that you want to know is, does it communicate well? Is it understandable? So you want to focus on, especially at the early stages, what the look and feel is rather than specific positions of elements on the page. So we're not arguing right now about where the Facebook button is. We are arguing or talking collaboratively about how does the overall aesthetic work? Does it match your brand? Does it match what you're thinking? But again, when you're talking about design, this isn't about your personal opinion. So like, uh, if you don't like the color blue, but the color blue is your corporate color, I'm sorry, like that is that you are not building this for you. Or if you really don't like, you know, like edgy things, but your site is for teenagers, like you're gonna have to get past that and go into the shoes of your audience. That being said, like there, you know, there are a lot of really important things you can say. When you're talking about designs also, especially again, we're working with WordPress, it's a content management system, there are often you know, many pages with similar types of content. We don't wanna have a conversation about specific pages necessarily. Um, we wanna talk about kind of the system. So again, when we were looking at the wireframes earlier and we saw different kind of content layouts, we wanna think about those. So whether that's talking about a project at the beginning stage, I don't, when I, when I get someone who, who comes to me with a new project and says, you know, it's a 20 page website, I go, okay, tell me what they do. Or like I've had projects where it's like, okay, no, it's really simple. It's just like a two page website. It's like the home page and the other page. I'm like, all right, well, what's on the other page? Well, it's this directory that you can sort by blah, blah, blah. And then you can also add this other thing where you can filter it by year. I'm like, all right, so that's not a page. But like, but I mean, it is my job to educate them because that's how they experience, you know, the web is in pages and I'm teaching them about systems. And a good client starts learning about those systems and can talk about them. And again, the biggest thing that you can do is be specific. Um, I don't like how it looks is not, um, it's not effective feedback. Like it doesn't help anyone. But if you can say like, I think that it's like, you know, there's, there's too much going on at once, like that's getting better, or like I don't like how close together all the lines of text are, like even if I as a designer disagree with you, that's still a point that we can start going forward. Like it's not just, I don't like it, like we can actually start having a conversation. Now say you're providing development feedback. So you've gotten past the design stage, we're now looking at how it works. How can you provide good development feedback? Um, your biggest role as a client is does it do what it is supposed to do? So how it works. Um, it's broken means a lot of different things. Um, again, we want to be specific. So say you have a slider and you, and you say it's broken. 
So does that mean like your slider is not showing up? Or does that mean it's showing up but it's showing all the wrong photos? Or does that mean it's showing half the photos? Or does that mean it works but you can't swipe between them? Or does that mean you can't pause it? Like it's broken is not useful. Being as specific as you can is great. Um, one thing I like to do when I'm talking with developers and I notice something's not working the way that I expect is I say, not only what am I seeing happen, but what did I expect to happen when I did that? Like, I clicked on this expecting it to save, but it just gave me a new field. You know, like, I didn't expect that. That could help address some usability issues. That could help tweak, you could tweak the UX. It could be that something's not working. But saying kind of what your expectations were when you did something and and what it's actually doing is really useful when critiquing development work. Um, and when you're evaluating a site, um, just in general, um, what we want to focus on when we're looking at it cross platforms, whether that's between different browsers, between different devices, is not necessarily pixel perfection. Um, you can achieve that, but it's very expensive and time consuming. What you want is you know, is it usable on all of these things? Does it follow like the standards of your brand across all the things? Like, does it basically feel like the same experience? But we're not, you know, overlaying the screenshot of Firefox with the screenshot of Safari with the screenshot of IE and be like, look at that, that's three pixels off, broken. Like, we're not doing that. We, we could, but again, expensive, not worth the time for 99% of cases. And then finally, these are some things that everybody can keep in mind. More gratuitous Minneapolis pictures, these great food trucks we have. Um, everybody should have kind of a shared understanding of the vocabulary. Now, I'm not expecting a client to be able to understand the nuances of development vocabulary. I'm not necessarily expecting a developer to understand the nuances of design vocabulary either. Like, we all have our own secret languages that we like to communicate in. Bless you. Um, but we do want to establish a baseline so that everybody can talk about the same things. So we do want everybody to know, you know, what's a page, what's a post, you know, what's a tag versus a category or whatever your custom taxonomy is, whatever your custom post types are called. What are those things called? If you're using any kind of fields or if you're using any, like on the other side, if you're working on a newspaper, like does the developer know what a deck is? You know, does the developer know like what some of these other lingos are that are unique to the industry? Everybody's going to have to use these shared terms. You know, do we know the difference between like a tab and a button and a page? Because it can get really confusing if one person's saying something but meaning something else to someone else. So everybody should have kind of a shared vocabulary at the beginning. That's really important. And that's just an education thing. Um, Everybody should always remember to ask lots of questions. Don't, do not be afraid to get clarification. Um, if you have to, and this is something I try to do, try to like either repeat back what someone says or try to paraphrase it in your own words. I like doing that too, because then you have to like use your brain and process it. So like if someone says something to you, you can be like, all right, so just so I'm understanding you correctly, what you're saying is that we should do this, this, and this, and this. And if that makes sense, then yay. And if not, then they can explain it to you more. But always make sure that you're on the same page as much as possible. And make sure to define your goals. Um, basically, what, what is the win for everyone? Everybody should be on the same page for that. Like, what are the deadlines? Um, what is the final product that needs to be produced? Uh, what is everybody's roles? What are the expectations? And also, what of these things is the most important? Like, maybe to the developer, the win is having a functional project, but to the client, the win is having it on this day so they can meet these obligations to their advertisers. Like, we need to know what the goal is to be able to work together. All right, so that, is, that concludes my presentation. Do you like how I totally didn't put a short link on here because I'm really smart? Um, that is not the short link. Um, I, will tweet it, I will tweet out a short link to where the slides actually are. That is not that and um, <laughs> update it. But that is it. So if you have any questions whatsoever, please ask. Yes? I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about the role of the content developer in the collaborative workflow, especially like in the initial stages. Sure. So the question was for the at-home players. Um, what, like, what's the role of the content creator? So like, if you have someone who's a, a writer or another consultant. Now, um, yeah, I kind of ascribe that to the client and what I was talking about just because that's the scenarios that I have worked in. Um, but obviously, the content creator has got to be brought in at the beginning. So most of the things that I said for the client in terms of content creation apply to that. Um, 
And I think that the person who's doing the writing or the head of the department of whoever's doing the writing or whoever that works should be in pretty direct content. With they all influence each other. Like, I don't know. Every, everybody who has, and they don't have to be involved in every single phone call. Like, nobody has to be involved in every single phone call. But at any key decision-making point, they should probably be involved. OK, yes? But to expand on that in your experience, have mm -hmm. you had the content developer and the person in charge of ultimately creating the content kind of lead the direction in terms of content strategy? Or is that more led by the designers and the developers? Meaning, like, if I'm writing, you know, landing page content, how am I breaking it down? Is it going to be a paragraph of text? Or are we doing, like, three different text boxes touching each, like, client pain point for describing service? Okay, so to paraphrase that for the video, basically, how, how is the content creator involved in kind of a leadership role of the project or not? Um, it depends on, like, their expertise. Like, if you just have, like, the intern who's writing copy, like, you know, they're going to be kind of more of a follower role. But if you've got somebody who's more of a strategist and, like, gets it, you know, let people play to their strengths. That's the whole beauty of this whole thing is like so that's a really awesome <laughs> non-final answer if it depends I'm really good at giving those kind of answers like it's great you 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 leave knowing about as much as you came in with <laughs> but yeah I mean it basically depends on the strengths of the person that's involved yeah so when you have a project that you're doing everything collaboratively iteratively uh, basically how do you go about making it scope because as you're going through this iterative process, you're going to have more ideas. It's going to expand well beyond what you originally envisioned. Sure. So the question was on reigning in scope creep. I think that's an awesome, partly in the whole like defining your goals section, like everybody has to kind of have an understanding of what the final goal is. But I mean, that's kind of the awesome part of the project manager aspect of it. Now, however that works, whether it is the project manager, whether it's like a someone higher up who's overseeing it, every structure is different. But like, it's kind of that capability's job to be able to go say like, hey, this is great, but you know, maybe that's a, a version two thing, or maybe we could do that instead of this. Like, again, I do a lot, I do stuff that's anywhere from like I'm literally the only person working on it up to like working with a much bigger team and so like when it's just me, obviously I'm the one that has to be like, okay, we can't, can't, I gotta be the project manager and designer, like no, I can't do that. But I don't know, like it's my great it depends answer, but that is more on like the project management side of things in terms of like you need a good not just a person who can tell you what to do, but a person who can like kind of see what's going on and direct it in the right direction. <laughs> All right. Yes? Um, in order to keep this communication going and flowing, do you use any kind of tool for that? I mean, maybe like Basecamp or Slack or something like that? So tools for communication. I have personally worked on projects that were like really traditional, like email with phone calls. I have worked on projects where we have an open Slack channel with scheduled Google Hangouts or Skype meetings. I've had ones where I have like a lot more frequent phone calls, like 15 minute phone calls every couple days just to go over what's going on. Um, not as much anymore. I have ones that are in person because most of my work is remote, but it like, I've also collaborated on bigger things with something like Basecamp, and I think it's important to not force a bunch of new tools onto a project just because you think it'll make it work. Like, if you have a client who really is most comfortable with, like, emails and phone calls, like, make that work somehow. Like, manage the expectations so, like, you're not going to be on two-hour phone calls every day, but, like, make that work. But if you have people that are open to new stuff, like, I really like Slack. I think it's great. Um, I think Google Hangouts should be great, and they just aren't. So I've had to like I, I like I love the concept of Google Hangouts and they're great, but I've I've had to use like more so Skype for that kind of thing. But I don't know. If you haven't used Slack yet, though, you should check it out. I mean the the WordPress um, like the actual WordPress like core chat is now all on Slack instead of IRC. So that's a good place to 
learn Slack. It's pretty fun. Yes? I'm curious about your thoughts or your experience with the, uh, the idea of the evolution of the designer and developer from the disappearance of the, the separation of so I actually have a lot of opinions on that. Um, the basically the the evolution of the designer and developer and kind of how those skill sets kind of evolved and are are, are not the same. Um, there's a huge amount of overlap in design and development, and you talk to ten people and you'll get ten different definitions of what they are. Um, Design tends to skew more towards the visual end of the spectrum and development tends to skew more towards the how things work type of the spectrum. Then you have all this front end stuff that's kind of in between because like as a designer, a web designer specifically, I do expect myself to know HTML, CSS, like, but then we've got WordPress, which is even weirder because front end development involves PHP. Like, we are just a bizarre ecosystem of not knowing what to call ourselves, and it's really interesting. Um, I actually, like, I'm not promoting myself that much, but I actually just wrote an article uh, for Torque, which is a WP Engine's publication about. Um, Speaking unicorn, unicorn being a phrase for the person who can do design and development, mm -hmm. and um, talking more towards developers learning the design side because there's plenty of people telling designers to learn the development side. Really the most important thing that I think is as long as we all have a shared vocabulary that we can communicate in, whatever works for you. So like if a designer like really can't do development stuff but they can talk about it, like even if they wouldn't be comfortable building it, like if that works for you, if you're not expecting your designer to build stuff, but they can still talk to you in the same language as you and not get scared, that can be good too. Yes? Do you feel pressure as a designer to learn JavaScript and Angular and all the new options? Do, all the new hotness. Um, do I feel pressure as a designer to basically start learning like JavaScript and stuff? Yes and no. I mean, if I wanted to go more the front-end developer route, sure. I've kind of resisted learning JavaScript just because I just don't have time. Like, I, I wouldn't be afraid of it. I just don't have time. Like, I, I learned enough PHP to be able to do theming, which is more than I really expected of myself in the first place. But there's some designers that can do all that stuff, and there's some that can't. And I guess it just depends on, like, how much opportunity you have to specialize versus generalize. But no, there's certainly, as a web designer, there is pressure to become a front-end developer. Like that's always there and you just have to know what your own balance is for how much of that you're getting into versus how much you're working with someone else. Yes? Okay, so what would you recommend as a developer, I'm speaking as a developer, mm -hmm. how would you recommend either on the developer side or designer side, how, because um, a lot of the designers now are the front end coders, which I'm kind of actually changed designer to front end coder, is um, now with all the different facets of um, CSS preprocessors, uh, using Grunge and all the libraries that are just that a lot of people are now using to put together at the very least HTML mockups, let's say, delivered. What would you recommend on either developer or the designer side to make that more of a cohesive, uh, you know, fit in terms of, oh, you were using Grunt and you're using sure. CSS or SCSS or, yeah. you know, what would you, what's the best methods that you found work better when you've got this certain workflow in these tools and you've now got to walk up to a developer who may be using something completely different or maybe not. Well, so the question is basically how to kind of collaborate the tools that you're using in front end development with whatever you're like your front end development with your back end developer and making sure you're all kind of using the same tools for like pre-processing and other stuff like that, which is yeah. Um, ideally, if you're not inheriting somebody else's project that's already been built a certain way that you have to change. Um, you know, you, you'd probably try to, if, if you're the one in charge of being able to seek somebody out, like obviously seek somebody out who's using a similar tools to you. At the very beginning, you know, if one of you uses less and one of you uses SAS, like you can only use one of them, so kind of figure out which one it's going to be. Like, and it's probably whoever's going to be touching it the most. Like, if your front end developer is going to be the one who's primarily messing with the styles, then like kind of go with whatever they're going to do. But if the 
front end person is really not doing too much of that, um, or they're not getting as heavily involved in it, they're starting it, but the back end person is going to be doing a lot more than do whatever they're going to do. I mean, it's kind of whoever has to deal with it the most. And it's, it's hard because there's a lot of tools out there like to do the same things. I mean, yeah, to like CSS pre-processing language and like a billion different ways to compile it, and it's hard. Um, so I guess kind of have to defer to whoever's going to be touching it the most, I think. <laughs> something like CodeKit, for example, would be adaptive. Yeah, I mean, that's CodeKit is what I use, but like every developer that I know that's a developer developer is using Grunt or something else. Like, okay, besides you. <laughs> I, I do consider you a developer developer. Well, okay. Now I want to go to Grunt. <laughs> You're like, now I'm not good enough. Man. Um, <laughs> yes, five minutes. You're not raising your hand. Okay. Yes. Just wondering about scope. You, know, you went through a great presentation there, and I'm thinking, okay, this is big corporate, thousand-page site, tons of categories, and so on. And then, you know, my buddy Alfonso mentioned, well, what about the plumber who's got, you know, a five-page, ten-page website in a local market? Mm -hmm. um, how do you apply the kind of scope that you're dealing with here, where you may be, like you said, you may be a project manager, a sure. developer, and dealing with the client directly? Um, how, how do you kind of address that with? all the things you've laid out there? Well, literally, the, all the projects I do by myself, which I do several by myself as well as with other people, I employ methods similar to this. So like those um, style tiles and wireframes and stuff that I showed you was for a client that I was the sole person working on it and I collaborated directly with them. And so I could use something similar. Like we talked about the styles, we talked, and I, I had a child theme for it. So I was able to be like, here's the styles, here's kind of a working, here's some wireframes, you like the wireframes, here's kind of a working version, we haven't designed it yet, let's tweak the design over here, let's work on this working version. Here, based on this, here's the kind of content I'm going to need from you so you can start working on that. Like it was a, a similar process, like, and it wasn't perfect, like there were times at the end where, you know, there was a lot more content missing, but they were aware of what it was at least, and then I just had to wait on them to get it for me, but we'd had those discussions. I, like, I use this process, whether it's me or lots of people, um, I don't know, like, I hope that helps. Is going to be pretty close, though, if you're using the same basic process versus the corporate versus well, I mean, I'm not doing by myself a large corporate site, so the pricing entirely depends on the size of, I mean, it depends on the company's pricing structure, the size of the team, the size of the hours, whether they price based on materials or value or whatever. Um, I don't know. No, I mean, I would definitely say, like, your pricing shouldn't be the same for everyone, but that's a different discussion that I'm not qualified to have. <laughs> yes? Yeah, I was going to say, how do you convey that to the client? Like, do you have a projection the the way I do things is semi hourly based I'm not saying it's the best way to do things um, but it is the way that I've been doing things that has worked. Um, I track all my time very religiously, so I'm pretty aware of how long things take me at this point. I've had some major mistakes. Um, so I can give them kind of, kind of this is how long each of these components are going to be, kind of this is how long the whole thing is going to be. If it starts going past this, you know, we'll have to revisit it. But it's, it's, that's not always the best way to price things either. And I am not the person qualified to talk about pricing. There's really awesome pricing talks on WordPress TV, which you should way totally watch because it's really interesting. Okay, do I have time for like one more or? One more, okay, yes. Um, if you're using a pre-built templated system where all you're doing is changing out content and colors, how can we apply something like the, t the tile system, style tile system, or is it even necessary if all we're doing is going into a framework and changing some colors? Well, I mean, you can still... I mean, if, if really you're just changing colors and that's it, like, you can still have a discussion about what the colors are and, like, look at them as swatches or look at, like how that looks in a navigation versus a, you know, whatever. I mean, you can still talk about it on an abstract level, even if you're not doing very much. I mean, it kind of applies to almost any level of stuff. Just use the parts that make sense. I mean, okay, that was, that's it. So I'm around all weekend, and that's my Twitter, and that's not the link to the slides. But <laughs>
But uh, thank you very much. <laughs>